Hello, I'm Adam Corbin, a partner at Mitchell Moores. I'm hosting this series of podcasts released in the run-up to the Serials Arable event at Thorsbury Estate in Nottinghamshire on the 13th and 14th of June this year. These podcasts accompany a series of articles which you can access on our website. We'll be at the show with our stand looking forward to meeting and speaking to friends old and new, hopefully over a cake, a gin or an ice cream. This time we're speaking about succession planning for rural businesses and I'm joined by two fantastic speakers, Vivian Williams and Ewan Williams, who I'll leave to introduce themselves. Viv. Thanks Adam. My name's Viv Williams. I'm a partner at Mitch Moores in our agricultural team and I specialise mainly in contentious agricultural matters. Ewan. Yes, thank you, Adam, and great to be here. My name is Ewan Williams and I'm a partner in our private client team. I specialise in all aspects of tax, trusts and succession planning, most frequently for landed estates, rural businesses and families with agricultural assets. Thank you. So we're going to be speaking today about succession planning. And just to unpack that a little bit, it's about really the passage of assets and whether that's business or property or personal assets to the next generation. And also obviously giving the next generation the opportunity to get started in order to be ready for that succession. So let's start off with thinking a little bit about the problems that we encounter commonly in practice. And I think Viv, you're going to start us off. I suppose my experience comes from when people have fallen out, mainly, and the issues that I generally encounter in practice, I suppose I can categorise into two main sections. One is in relation to where families have made promises or there are expectations in relation to inheritance. And it's those sorts of cases where communication has been really poor and people feel that they have worked all their lives on the back of a promise that they will inherit the farm. And so it's those sorts of cases which come out quite often. But also, I think in terms of dealing with succession, I deal with tenancy matters. So planning for succession to the next generation of the farming family and whether that's acting for a landlord or for a tenant. And Ewan, what's your perspective? Well, on the sort of private client succession planning side, we're the other side of the same coin. Three main issues that I'd like to to highlight. The first one is that these are really difficult matters to start with. It's difficult to try and convince families to have these conversations about succession. These issues are very often in the too difficult pile. The can is kicked down the road. It's very, very difficult to manage that and manage the expectations of the next generation. So as Viv mentioned, communication is absolutely key to that. What is the long-term vision? And then as a family, let's talk about it. Let's put our cards on the table and see what we're trying to achieve. The other problem that we come across a lot of is inadequate tax planning, really, and planning appropriately for the succession of the business, particularly on death. Rural businesses can evolve. They often take different shapes. And sometimes tax is is put on the, the back burner. It's really important to keep it on the radar because by some careful structuring, one can really achieve a lot and quite often a very tax efficient transfer either during lifetime or on death. And then the third piece really of the same puzzle is really implementation and documentation from a succession point of view. Once you've had those conversations and thought about the tax, it's so important for things to be implemented appropriately so that they take effect as you wish them to. There's so much value in in getting that right. And it makes things easier in what is almost always a hugely difficult time for the family and the business generally. Viv, you touched earlier on the issues around succession to tenancies. Uh, Of course, we've got another party often involved in those problems, which is the landlord and not the previous generation or the present generation. Would you just elaborate a little bit on the issues that you encounter in practice uh, in those circumstances? Yeah, that's a really good point. So we come across it both from a landlord's point of view. So we act for landlords and we act for tenants. We act for basically the person who phones us up first. If we're acting from a landlord's point of view, then obviously they want to know what's happening with their land. They want to make their own plans. They want to do their own succession planning. And so we quite often asked to advise landlords on, is there going to be another succession? 
Is there a succession tenancy? Does this particular person who's in occupation, does their tenancy carry succession rights? How long is the land going to be tied up for? And those are all important considerations from a landlord's point of view, planning for their future. On the flip side of that, we've got the tenant, the tenant's point of view. So they quite often want to know, does their tenancy carry succession rights? And generally, if it's a tenancy which is an old style tenancy granted before the 12th of July 1984, it generally carries succession rights. And there are certain other categories as well, which are relevant if it's granted after that date. But we can be involved on behalf of a tenant quite early on, maybe many years before the succession event, planning how to make that the strongest application that it could be. And that's the ideal world. We want to be involved as early as possible looking at the structure of the business. But equally, we can be involved very late on, perhaps after the tenant has died, putting in the application for succession and trying to make sure everything's all in order. So after the tenants passed away, the original tenants passed away, there's a particularly time pressured period then, isn't there, for the successor's side? Yeah, so the applicant, which can either be the wife or a son or daughter, they've got to fall within the category of a close relative, and that's generally the definition. They've only got three months from the date of death to get their application into the tribunal. And so if no one's ever thought about it before, it really is a very time pressured period to get everything in order at a time when actually people have got more pressing things perhaps to think about as well. So the earlier we can be involved, the better. And I think it's also important just to get advice early on, because in my experience, people think about succession as just being something that happens, but without really giving a lot of thought to do they fall within the right category of people? Can they make the application? So for example, you can't succeed to your grandfather's tenancy. And so that can be a bit of a problem if it's if you're trying to skip a generation. Likewise, you can't succeed to your uncle's tenancy. So if you've got, say, two brothers who are in partnership, only one of them's the tenant, but it's the niece or nephew who's the next generation in that business, then that can be a problem in terms of trying to succeed. So a bit of planning planning and early dialogue and thinking about these issues is is just really important because the last thing you want to be finding out is within that three month period after death that you've got a whole host of problems because you can't succeed to the tenancy and therefore ultimately the landlord is, is in a position to give a notice to quit. Okay, so Surely, though, the notorious proprietary estoppel cases that we've seen over the last 20 or so years have made people much more careful in their succession plans, haven't they? Well, you'd like to think so, wouldn't you? Unfortunately, I don't think that's really been the experience on the ground. So the estoppel cases are the ones where someone says, I've been promised the farm and I've worked all my life. You commonly see them reported in the Farmers Weekly or in the Daily Mail. And the problem is that although these cases are widely reported, I think the underlying problems remain difficult to solve. So it's still about the family dynamics. It's still about the communications that Ewan mentioned earlier. And it's still about normally or quite often having siblings who the parents want to cater for who are not necessarily involved in the farming business. And so I think that whilst estoppel cases are getting greater press, the underlying problems don't necessarily go away. Would you agree with that, Ewan? I I would, Viv. There's no getting away from the fact really that framing a succession plan for a rural business is very difficult. Rural businesses encompass very complex circumstances, assets with significant value, varied asset holding structures like partnerships and companies, complex tax treatments, generational involvement, as you touched on, Viv. And that's all against a very rapidly changing background environment as well as businesses diversify. So 
rural businesses are often ideal breeding grounds, really, for these sorts of succession issues. It's very difficult to tick all the boxes and make sure that everybody's expectations are met. Really fine balance as well, because, you know, the upper generation needs to make sure that they're not being overly generous. They need to retain assets for their retirement and in some cases retain sufficient control over assets as well because as as they pass down a generation, they do become more susceptible to outside forces like divorces, financial problems, all of which have you know the potential to fragment these businesses and to prevent them from remaining you know integral. On the private client side, again, we're seeing a lot more of the so-called family business constitutions or family business charters, which can be a really helpful means of pulling together agreement on these key issues, which frame the overall direction of the succession strategy, the direction of the business. Really helpful as a blueprint for what is trying to be achieved. I think it's, it does prompt discussion, doesn't it? If you can get people thinking that actually this sort of framework is a good idea, then it causes them to go through the issues one by one and try and give some thought to how we're going to provide for other members of the family. How is the farming business going to be able to survive by itself? How is it going to be funded? And in an ideal world, these are all things that should be considered and talked about whilst people are still alive. Yes, absolutely. And and how can we protect ourselves against those outside forces? Some of the things that we see, we see uniform wills across family members. There's an agreement that they will structure things in a certain way. There are permitted transfer clauses that could be included in partnership agreements, for example, which ease administration on death. There can be an agreement between generations that uh, partners enter into pre or post nuptial um, agreements as well to prevent interest passing outside the core family. Some really valuable tools, really, from a succession point of view. I think another factor which people are often concerned about is the handing on of land to the next generation. You talk briefly about prenuptial arrangements, which of course is one way of making sure that in the event of divorce, someone doesn't run off with the family farm. But I think another tool is using partnership agreements to clearly set out what is intended, for example, on death. And by encouraging people to enter into partnership agreements, they can then talk about these things and really legislate for what happens in certain events. And it's also a really good way of perhaps thinking about should land be included in a partnership or should it lie outside of the partnership? And quite commonly, we find that people, for whatever reasons, quite rightly enter into partnership agreements, perhaps to satisfy a requirement of the bank, for example, but don't often give a lot of thought to should this particular asset be a partnership asset or should it lie outside of the partnership? Absolutely. Um, And the point that you made, Viv, about partnership agreements it's so important for advisors to collaborate as well. You perhaps drafting the partnership agreement to deal with issues arising on death, but me drafting the corresponding wills to make sure that those two documents dovetail and talk to each other to achieve the desired outcome. I think uh, what I an observation I would make is that a lot of the time families have done some planning. They've done some tax planning and they've done some succession planning and and that planning has resulted in documents but those documents then stand as sort of small islands in a stream of other evidence and in a stream of evidence over quite a long period of time and so one point I think that is really important to remember is that these things need to be continually reviewed and reconsidered because people's intentions do change and people particularly the younger generation do often move on and many of the disputes that we encounter now are not so much where there's been no planning at all but where the planning is all rather incomplete or all rather a long time ago and nobody can really remember why exactly they entered into a partnership agreement uh, in the first place or why they made land transfers or why they granted tenancies and and so forth. So I think there's definitely a a, a need to 
consider these things to be an active document, an active process. And that's partly why the, I think the family constitutions are a good thing, because they have baked into them a process of review, don't they? Absolutely. And indeed, from a from a tax perspective as well, structures change, strategies change, tax laws change. So it's all part of that continual review to make sure that the succession strategy is efficient, but the tax strategy is, is, is efficient as well. And Viv, what, in practice, what sort of things do people sometimes forget when they enter into a partnership agreement um, in order to provide for some succession? Well, I think that they they quite often don't think through who they want to end up with what at the at the end of the day. So you have to think about what what events happen during the lifetime of a partnership. Well, someone might retire. What's supposed to be happening then? And when someone dies, what should happen then? And you've got not only the land to think of, but you've also got all the kit, the machinery and the the capital, the cash. And trying to think through all of those outcomes and who should benefit. And you can legislate for all of that in the partnership agreement. But you do need to take each issue in turn and think about it, where do I want this particular value and this particular asset to end up at the end of the day? It's not just simply a question of, oh, well, here's a partnership agreement, we'll print it off and it'll be suitable for all, because everybody's position is different. And some families might want to leave land outside of the partnership to benefit and someone who's not in the partnership and have a separate tenancy agreement in place over that land. Alternatively, they might want to put it on the balance sheet make sure it's a partnership asset, and then how that is left on death is determined by the partnership agreement rather than, as Ewan says, by the will. How about the other structure that we commonly see, the limited company? Where does that fit in uh, with the party's intentions for running their business? Um, We'll start with you first, Viv, and then we'll, we'll ask Ian a little bit more about the tax consequences. Yeah, I mean, lots of lots of families do use companies as their trading vehicle. And in some ways, that's simpler and easier because a company is a separate legal entity. And so it's very clear whether something belongs to the company or not. With a partnership, it's often less clear whether something is a partnership asset. So with a company, you know what's in and you know what's out. The challenge with companies does come with succession planning because quite often you can trade for a long period of time, build up a considerable amount of wealth in a company. And that might be set up by father, is now trading with sons. But as you get further down the generations, things might become a little more fractious and you get to a position where you need to separate out the two sides of the family. Now, if all of that is within a corporate wrapper, that becomes a little bit more tricky because you need to effectively de merge the company into two separate companies to satisfy the succession requirements of the two sides of the family. It's not insurmountable, and Ewan can talk about the tax consequences. I think one further point is that we do see quite often just a blend of companies and assets held personally. So at some point in time, someone decided it was a good idea to set up a company and to go and buy that bit of land and pop it into the company. And then you see other parcels of land owned individually by other members of the family. And that sort of pattern of disparate assets in different entities can be a bit of a challenge to sort out as well. Just to sort of follow on from that, completely agree really on the tax side where corporate structures are involved and have been in place for a number of years, then it does become more difficult from a tax perspective to move assets in, out and around. From a tax perspective where a corporate structure is involved in a in a rural business context, it is slightly inflexible. Obviously, there are tax implications If assets are transferred into a company, people tend to forget that obviously it it has a, a separate legal status and there would be capital gains tax issues to that. Moving assets out of a company frequently has tax issues as well, not least potentially SDLT, which gets rather hideously complex. Lots to watch out for where a company is involved in this sort of context. And I think it's that in point about they can be inflexible in certain instances. Ewan, I think we probably would like to go on next to 
have a little think about the perennial tax planning issues which you often need to turn to and, and consider when you're going through a succession planning exercise with a family. Do you think you'd be able to encapsulate those in, in into a number of short, succinct points? Well, I'll give it a go. <laughs> um, well, I think for, for rural businesses, IHT planning, such an important point. The opportunity is there if planning is carried out proactively and in a timely manner, then it is very possible for rural businesses to structure assets in highly tax efficient ways. Obviously, we we know all about the availability of agricultural relief. We know about the availability of business relief. We regularly advise on the creation and maintenance of Balfour style structures where mixed estates are structured as a single composite trading business so that investment assets such as let cottages qualify for business relief as part of a much wider trading business. Capital tax rates have been relatively fixed now for a, a number of years and for the moment I think there is a school of thought to say that it is a relatively favourable capital tax landscape. As I say the opportunity is there it might not be there forever with a with a general election on the horizon. From a tax planning perspective a lot of minds were focused I think during the pandemic um, and lots of generational succession planning was accelerated at that point due to uncertainty over tax rates and reliefs and so on and so forth. But that's only part of the story. Tax is important, yes, but we go back to the importance of it being a balancing act and that's where the practical challenges come in. The point about retaining sufficient assets for your retirement, the point about giving assets away with no strings attached um, so that you're not caught by the highly punitive gift of reservation of benefit rules, and then achieving that generational balance as well between children. Are children involved in the business so that they can take a share or perhaps be brought in as partners? Can the business be kept together? Are there sufficient assets elsewhere to achieve that element of fairness across the the family whilst maintaining the integrity of the business? So tax is important. Yes, the opportunities are there for that sort of planning, but it is always a balancing act and making sure that that generational involvement is there is absolutely key to making the whole thing work. Thank you. I think you did manage to encapsulate it in a number of short, discrete, succinct points. Viv, we're going to go on to talk next about the new opportunities that uh, particularly rural businesses encountering, um, particularly with thinking about diversification uh, and natural capital. Would you be able to give us a, a short summary of what those sort of opportunities look like uh, before we then go on to talk about what changes might be required to succession planning in order to accommodate them? I can try. Um, so there's lots of changes that have um, come about, could say, as a consequence of us uh, leaving the European Union and having to create our own environmental policy in England and Wales. And so we've got a greater focus on environmental schemes, for example, trying to use land for biodiversity net gain, which is now going to be a requirement of planning. And so rural land farming businesses have an opportunity to take advantage of all of those. And then there are obviously what we call natural capital assets and generally using land for the public good and being paid for using land for the public good. And so those sorts of wider schemes are of interest to anybody who's got land available to them. It can be a challenge, of course, because whilst you might own land, it might not be within your possession. And so whilst there are opportunities there, uh, you do think have to think carefully about whether or not you can take advantage of them. And so we were talking before about tenancies and the wording of a tenancy agreement might dictate whether or not you can enter land into a particular scheme or whether or not you need to go off and speak to your landlord uh, before doing so. And I think the other thing to bear in mind is that with any new opportunity on the horizon where you're a tenant, for example, and you are trying to secure succession 
for the next generation, you have to think about, is it something which is going to prejudice my succession application in due course? Or do I need to think more carefully about how I go about trying to tap into this resource? Because potentially you don't want to be doing that if it scuppers your succession chances further down the line. You and I think it's fair to say that quite a lot of these natural capital schemes don't really involve doing a great deal of farming. Quite a lot of them are forestry based. And is it right that forestry and things that aren't farming so much, or aren't agriculture uh, are not necessarily good for tax planning? Yeah, uh, th- there's a lot of concern about this at the moment. The obvious example, as you've mentioned, is that by entering into one of these schemes, the land use will no longer be deemed to be for the purposes of agriculture. And so potentially agricultural relief would be lost. I suppose on a larger scale, there's also the potential to upset those Balfour style structures that I mentioned, often seen in a landed estates context and in rural businesses generally, so as to tip the balance from trading to an investment in a worst case scenario. We as advisors, and there's a really excellent article written by one of our partners, Ben Sharples, on this sort of uh, issue. But we're craving much greater clarity in relation to how the tax rules will affect families engaging in natural capital or BNG schemes. The CLA have been lobbying quite strongly for a while now about the extension of the definition of agriculture to include these sorts of schemes so that agricultural relief is not affected. And of course, the government are in the middle of of the consultation that they announced in the March budget. We really do hope that there is some sort of tangible outcome to this that will go some way to helping us as advisors and families, of course, frame how best to to diversify and how that affects their the underlying tax position. It would be a, an incredibly helpful piece in the overall puzzle because there is some, you know, reluctance and uncertainty, certainly from a tax perspective, as to which way to go about doing this. The other issue that I wonder if you could just cover briefly, Ewan, is the difference between agricultural value and development value and how that causes problems, in, uh, particularly in, in, in planning uh, inheritance tax. If land is said to be used purely for, for the purposes of agriculture, i.e. a field in the middle of nowhere that is farmed, then that field has an agricultural value. Now, agricultural relief can potentially apply to relieve 100% of that agricultural value from inheritance tax. Often, or in certain circumstances, that field can have a value above and beyond its agricultural value. So if the field had potential hope value, i.e. the potential for it to be developed at some point, then the market value of that field, the price that someone would pay for it on the open market, would be in excess of its agricultural value that can have very, very significant inheritance tax consequences for farmers and farming businesses because the default position is that the excess market value would not be covered by agricultural property relief. So you have to try and start thinking about other ways of covering that, i.e. if it is used or part of a composite trading business, then there is potential for it to qualify for 100% business relief and continue to be um, relieved from inheritance tax in that way. You've mentioned Balfour a couple of times. Do you think that's generally making landlords more enthusiastic about farming in hand and, and having tenancy surrendered? Yes, I think that's fair to say. Balfour has been around for a number of years now. It works and rural businesses, can, if structured appropriately, can gain very significant inheritance tax advantages if structured in that way. It's very interesting as well to see how the next generation approach that, the next generation of estate owners, where they may already have their career and they're not going to be on the on the estate. So just in close, perhaps each of you could set out for us what your three top tips are for good succession planning. And we'll start with you, Viv. 
Uh, three top tips. Um, I think good communication, early dialogue, and then always have an eye to the tax. And the problem for Ewan is that he's got to go next and come up with three which are different. Sorry, Ewan. <laughs> Good luck, Ewan. <laughs> Absolutely. There could be some overlap here. I mean, communication is is so, so important. I suppose one that I'd add to Viv is that it's fine to have these conversations and they go well and you get your cards on the table, but then sometimes nothing happens. It goes back to that point that you made, Adam, about continual review and the, the need to actually do what you say you're going to do and implement these things. That's where these family constitutions, family charters can be so helpful because they put together that overall blueprint that can be revisited as the years come and go. Great. Well, thank you ever so much, both of you. I've actually got a further question for each of you in close, and that is what you're looking forward to most about going to serials this year. Viv, I think we'll start with you. Uh, we are having a women in rural property event, which I'm very much looking forward to. I can't remember if we're serving gin at that event, but we are. if we are, I'm looking forward to it even more and lots of ice cream as well. We're also serving insects at the women in rural property event. I thought that might be the case, but I wasn't going to be bold enough to uh, to suggest that um, because I didn't know if that had been kiboshed, <laughs> but it clearly hasn't. So uh, I like like chomping my way on a cricket. So um, that'll be fun. <laughs> Um, you and no, no gin or insects for us. We're going to have to um, go and find somebody else's stand to be on during that time. So an, anything you're looking forward to? Can't go for gin, but sort of a, a locally brewed cider might be lovely. Something summery and, and refreshing. Um, well, the, the, the Wurzels are appearing. So maybe uh, cider and the Wurzels might be on the cards for us while the uh, women in rural property are, are having gin and insects. Very much looking forward to it. No, it's, it's going to be fantastic and it will be great to see lots of familiar faces and obviously to, to meet lots of new ones as well. Great. Well, thank you ever so much, both of you. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. 